head of the Astrophysics Laboratory of the <laughs> He's a teacher, he's a professor of Physics 81. For this morning, I will be talking about the different wonders of astronomy. So, most of us, actually, when we were still young, uh, there was this point in our life when we were interested in astronomy. Who is the most famous in the world? Who is the most famous in the world? Who is the most famous in the world? Who is the most famous in the Uh, we have different uh, ways of how to uh, do that. 
And the most important tool for astronomers is actually your telescope. So a telescope is essentially a device that would eventually uh, make distant objects appear as if they are near. So one example of a telescope is this one, that you can see in front. So this is one of the telescopes that we have at the Astrophysics Laboratory. So very small. I think some of the students of E5R was able to use this telescope uh, project in the uh, last anyone. So we use this for solar observation. Uh, this one is also another famous telescope. Uh, this is called the Hale, uh, Hale Telescope in Mount Palomar Observatory. So it was this telescope that Sir Edwin Hubble used to uh, determine that, or to observe, that the universe was expanding. Okay? Uh, there are actually different types of telescopes that astronomers use, but generally you can classify them into two kinds. You have your refracting telescope and your reflecting telescope. In your refracting telescope, uh, essentially these are telescopes that are made from lenses. Okay. So if you look, uh, one example is what we have in front. Okay. So when you look at the, the interior, the cross section of your telescope, uh, you can see here this is a lens. So the light coming from the star would eventually enter the lens, and it would focus in on your uh, here, here, which is known as your focal point. Okay. That was my eyepiece that uh, you are eventually going to use to magnify the image. So that's for refracting telescopes or for refractors. On the other hand, when you have reflecting telescopes or reflectors, you use, instead of using lenses, you now use mirrors. But, but this is not the ordinary mirror that you can see. Uh, the mirror that you can see about the ISO. So most of the time, these are spherical or parabolic mirrors. So uh, difference is only so, uh, the light coming from the star would enter the tube or the telescope first, and then eventually it would reflect, uh, it would focus the light to your secondary mirror, and then you try to view it on the side. So it's a way to view it. So in the telescope, you need to the side or the side. Sometimes you do it on the side. Now there's a third classification known as your catadioptric telescopes. So this is sort of a hybrid between a reflecting telescope and a refracting telescope. So here, uh, it, both, it, it uses both lenses and mirrors. For example, the Schmidt Ganymede, which is the most common type of telescope that you can use. So when you look at, uh, if you look at stores that will sell telescopes, most of the time it's a Schmidt Ganymede type. So it uses a Schmidt corrector plate, you know, which is a type of lens, and then that lens would focus it on your mirror. So metal on lens and mirror at the same time. Uh, the same goes for your maximum category. Uh, you know, like instead of a corrector lens, you have your uh, thin lens, you know. Now you know that you have a like the bend of light, and the, uh, which is again reflected by your mirror. And then focus here. So this is known as your category focus. Yeah, so that's why category. Uh, so, some examples of famous telescopes all over the world. Uh, this one is uh, the Yerkes Observatory Telescope. Uh, this is uh, well, the largest uh, refracting telescope, a refractor in the world, built in 1897. How large is it? The aperture or the diameter of the lens is around 1.02 meters. So, that's the lens of the telescope. And because of uh, one problem with refractors is that it needs a very long focal length. The length of the tube is around 20 meters, so 19 meters. To give you an idea of how large this object is, is So this is a full size of the object. The whole observatory is much larger uh, than the lecture hall that we are in right now. Compare that to the size of the telescope. Uh, another famous telescope is the Keck Telescope in Mauna Kea in Hawaii. So here, uh, this is one of the largest telescopes in the world right now. Uh, we have this is a 10 meter telescope, so 10 meters zoom diameter, no mirror. Okay. But this is not a solid mirror, it is more of a segmented type of mirror. So it uses hexagonal shape here. Parang parang panikaw design. So again, to give you an idea how large this object is, so 
So this is the first one happening. Okay. So, uh, so in comparison for business text, the size of the mirror, the lead lang yung tao. So it uses 36 hexagonal mirrors. Uh, each one is about 1.8 meters in diameter and weighs about 880 pounds. And there are two of these kinds of telescopes in Hawaii. Okay. So this is uh, the Mauna Kea site in Hawaii. So why, why is Mauna Kea popular for astronomers? Because Mauna Kea, which is located about 4 kilometers above sea level, uh, has a very good sea condition, visible at uh, ground level, and this is your uh, radio telescope. Uh, using radio waves to run uh, Evo. So this is one of the largest radio telescopes in well actually it's the largest radio telescope in the world. This is the Arecibo uh, telescope in Puerto Rico. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with James Bond movies, so maybe it's a James Bond movie. Uh, kung napalag niyo yung movie na Golden Eye, kung napalag ng Golden Eye. Panag uh, yung mabalik mo. Bidan din lang yun. Uh, 1996. Uh, I think it's the year of work. Yeah. So 1996, uh, in Golden Island. So this was uh, the venue for the final showdown between uh, James Bond and his uh, enemy. So he's still in the last one. He's the last one. He's the last one. He's the last one. He's the last one. Now, one of the reasons why it's very difficult to observe uh, astronomical objects here on Earth is because of the atmosphere. So, the atmosphere introduces what you call your turbulence. Uh, so because of this turbulence, you see your stars now as twinkling lights. Right? Without the atmosphere, it uh, means to twinkle the mga lights na nakikita or yung mga stars na nakikita natin. So one way to counteract this effect is to, well of course, you have to go above the atmosphere. So when you go above the atmosphere, you go into the realm of what you call your space telescope. Okay? So the space telescopes that we have right now are currently giving us one of the best views ever of the universe, so the clearest and the best views of the universe. The most famous of which is your Hubble Space Telescope. So, uh, so this is a uh, uh, very old telescope already. Uh, it was launched in 1990, but because of some uh, very large defect in the mirror, as in the curve of the mirror is not by a large margin, by 4 microns, Malinang so, 4 microns in the mirror curvature. Uh, so we have to repair it. One problem with space telescope is that it takes a long time to repair. Because it's not like it's just going to be able to repair it. Well, it's going to be able to repair You have to really go into space. So the repair man are actually high-tech repair. So they repaired it in 1993. And since then, it was giving us excellent views of the universe. That's just the first image that I showed you, which is the Hubble. Now, compared to the Keck telescope, it's really quite small. It's only 2.4 meters in diameter. But because of the location of it, it's located way above the atmosphere, uh, without any interference or without any turbulence, uh, it has, it, even though there is a small, it has a small aperture, it provides much clearer views. Now, there's a plan to decommission the Hubble Space Telescope in the future, so it will be uh, decommissioned, I think, in a matter of a few years. And then hopefully it will be replaced by uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. So the James Webb Space Telescope uh, is, is almost three times larger than the Hubble Space Telescope. It's about 6.5 meters in diameter. And however, the United States Congress is still uh, debating whether they will fund the James Webb Space Telescope. So hopefully, uh, the business is not fun for another time. But not all space telescopes are limited to the optical range. We also have different types of uh, telescopes, uh, space telescopes, particularly the ultraviolet telescope. So this is one example, the IUD. Uh, so this one observes in the ultraviolet range. 
We have the Spencer Space Telescope. This one is uh, more recent. Uh, I think it launched in 2003. Uh, this one views uh, the object in infrared range. In infrared mode. We have your Chandra X-ray Observatory, which uh, views the object in the X-ray range. Now, why do astronomers want to observe these, or to what, why do astronomers want to have these types of space telescopes? Why do they want to have these types of space telescopes? It's because when you look at different wavelengths in the necromagnetic spectrum, there are the celestial objects who have different properties. Some of them are more evident in other wavelengths, such as X-rays or ultraviolet, compared to uh, visible light. What example is this? Uh, this is known as your M1 or your Crab Nebula. So this is a visual image or optical image of the Crab Nebula. What about Crab? What is the name Crab? But you can even write it up to you. So it's a shell. So, imagine yung yung top shell, yung tanks of Crab. Yung shell. Walang mga kamay yan. Yung shell lang. <laughs> so this is actually a remnant, a uh, supernova remnant, rem or a remnant of a dead star or a, uh, an explosion of a star about 1,000 years ago. So here, uh, this is a very good image, but when you try to look at uh, this, uh, when you try to look at the crab nebula in the infrared range, the thing must be done. Totally different. If you look at the ultraviolet man, the so you can see So there are a dense source of ultraviolet light that we have. And when you try to look at X-rays, you actually see a very, very different structure. Uh, in, uh, in this is actually the same image. In the this is the same object, but you are viewing it at two different images. So here in the X-ray image, you can see actually a very small point here, which is a very strong source of X-ray. And this is actually your pulsar, or your rapidly rotating neutron star, which is a remnant of uh, the supernova explosion. No, uh, supernova explosion of 1,000 years ago. So this is the reason why astronomers want to observe uh, different objects and different wavelengths. Because some properties are more evident in uh, certain wavelengths compared to others. So, such as in this case, Pantita na there is a strong source at the center compared to the optical condition. Okay. And we do this actually for different types of different objects in the sky. Uh, which makes it very difficult then. Uh, and that is the data collected. Okay. So we have a lot of data in astronomy collected, but very few astronomers. Okay. So that's one of that, because of that, astronomers, the astronomical community, Makes the data public. Okay. So, if you want to see the data, you can easily download these kinds of images on the internet because it's very, uh, the public data. Okay. Uh, there are any restrictions on the internet. Okay. So, it's free available to everyone. Uh, we, as in a strong easy lang naman visible light or uh, sorry, uh, electromagnetic waves. I mean, I don't know. Uh, we also study uh, particles that emit or that are coming from uh, astronomical, astronomical sources, such as your cosmic rays and your neutrinos. Uh, so, you don't have to But in 2012, you don't have to be in there's nothing to fear about neutrinos because while sitting down there in your seats, your billions and billions of neutrinos are actually passing through your body without you even knowing it. So it's a neutrino is a highly non-interactive particle and can have a means of thousand you know, the ghost particle. Okay. It can penetrate the earth without interacting uh, with any material in the earth. Uh, so all your life you know lang na bobon part of the neutrino. So because of this highly non-interactive nature of neutrinos uh, we have to make very huge detectors to observe these particles. So one example of this is the Super Kamehameha detector in Japan, Super K. Uh, it uses 50 kilotons of water to detect your material. And it's located one kilometer underground. So we uh, have so detector. To give you an idea how large this detector is, 
So that's two persons on a boat. And the mga kasa is a detector. So they are, uh, so these are actually yung mga pinatawa natin TMPs or photo multiplier tubes. So they are actually repairing the uh, super tube. Okay. So, don't imagine yun na, parang pwede na kayo mag, mag, mag mga kaan dito. Well, what do you mean pwede mag-fish yun? Wala naman si Kaya dyan. But to give you an idea how large this detector is. But compared to another kind of detector, this is still quite small. Okay, but oh. Because we have what we call your ice cube. And this one is located one kilometer deep under that part in ice. Okay? So, why should we have an ice cube? Well, more than five feet cubic shape. Yeah? And how large is this? This is one cubic kilometer in volume. One kilometer by one kilometer by one kilometer. That's right. That's ice cube. That's what I imagine it. So, so it's like to either 1.4 kilometers underground, so they drill holes to put the detectors in the ice cube. Uh, to give you an idea how large this is, uh, this is the Eiffel Tower in Paris. The size of the Eiffel Tower, which is around 300 meters. Okay. So this is three times the size or the height of the Eiffel Tower. And this is located deep within the Antarctic ice. Okay. So this is another type of regional telescope that it's currently operational. I think it's, it's, it's now operational in uh, Antarctica. So, it's now operational in Antarctica. What's the key of astrophysics? So why do we use these kinds of telescopes? Of course, we use them to uh, observe the different elements or the different things that we can see in the universe. So we have a lot of them. Uh, the most familiar to us are your planets, of course, since we live in one planet. Uh, and then you have your star. We are close to one star, which is the sun. So, well, your planets are actually uh, objects that are orbiting around the common star or group of stars. So these are byproducts or excess products of star formation. So tayo, people on Earth, parang excess na tayo. Tayo yung unused material nung nag-form yung sun. Uh, so the yung star naman, such as our sun, so these are molecular clouds that eventually uh, burn off or ignite that, and then have what you call your hydrogen burning. But this is not the same thing that you find in CDK or phosphor or burning that. Uh, this is actually nuclear fusion. So you, in the center of the sun, hydrogen is being uh, combined to form helium. Okay? So yeah, as a result of that, there are many excess energy that in the sun. Uh, you also have constellations, the uh, So these are apparent kind of arrangements of stars uh, that form recognizable, uh, recognizable pattern with respect to a certain reference point. So with respect to our point of view here on Earth. We have your interstellar ma uh, matter. So these are materials that essentially uh, uh, jump, space uh, uh, stellar jump. So they occupy vast, vast, vast areas between stars. And then you have anomalous objects, you know, uh, objects that are still under uh, research. So we're still not sure what is the real nature of these objects, such as your black holes, your quasars, your GRBs, and your gamma ray bursts. So all these uh, objects, when we are inaptly visible in the night sky. Now let's go through them one by one. Uh, first, we go to the planet. Okay? Uh, before, in the past, we had a clear-cut definition how would you say an object is a planet or not. Now, in 2006, the International Astronomical Union, or the IAU, which is the supreme body of astronomers worldwide, uh, eventually they came up with a decision to have a criteria for, a planet, for an object to be considered as a planet. So they came up with three criteria for this. Number one, it should be orbiting the sun. Uh, Number two, it should have sufficient mass for itself gravity to overcome rigid body forces so that it assumes a hydrostatic equilibrium shape. And finally, it should have cleared the neighborhood of this or around its orbit, meaning 
within its region in space, it should be the largest or the dominant object. Now, in the past, you're wrong. We have nine planets, right? But because of this definition in 2006, one planet was denoted to a dwarf planet, and that is your Pluto. So now we only have eight planets. Planet. Because even though Pluto was able to satisfy criteria A and criteria B, it, it fails to satisfy criteria C. Because in the region of Pluto, there are actually objects that are almost the same size, or in some cases, even larger than Pluto itself. So that is all. Uh, he would have said that Pluto is the dominant object in the area of the solar system. So they actually didn't go into a dwarf planet. So we have eight planets as of now. We have your Mercury, or Venus. Okay, so this one is a little bit interesting because if you try to look at the rotation period of Venus, this is around 243 Earth days. So if we have equal to that, on this axis, it takes about 243 Earth Earth days. But in the period, in the around the sun, there's only 224 days. Meaning, in Venus, one year is shorter than one day. So, if you have a lot of time, you can see that you have a lot of time. You can see that you have a lot of time. You can see that you have a lot of time. You can see that you have a lot of time. So, the Venus is a situation. Of course, this one, the rock of the earth is concluded. Okay, that's what I have got to do. So, I have another property. Of course, another, although it's not a planet, one object of a familiar design is the moon. I mean, it's an added to our world. At least once a month. Then you have your Mars, okay, for the next planet. So in order to from uh, going farther away from the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, the largest planet that we have right now, and also the one with the most number of moons, around 63, 63 moons. We have Saturn, the main planet. Uh, uh, for most, uh, for the general public, I think we have the main planet. Well, you can view that happening. If you have a decent view, such as this, then you have. I didn't know that yet, even in Saturn. Uranus, the one in the Sun, and finally, your Mercury. Okay, so you can see that Mercury is the largest planet that we have. In addition to that, we have dwarf planets. This is Pluto, which is the largest planet in our system. So, one thing that you can notice here is that it takes about 248 years. The first year is that for Pluto to orbit around the sun. So the one uh, year of Pluto is about 248 years due to the Earth. Uh, you also have constellations. So constellations are a parent arrangement of stars that uh, name, that is named after God's heroes and so on. So this is an internationally agreed upon arrangement. There are 88 constellations right now, uh, as defined by the IAU. On the other hand, we also have what's called your asterisks. So asterisks are arbitrary groupings of stars uh, that perceive uh, mnemonic device for your uh, stars. And in some cases, asterisks are more popular than constellations. I'll give you one example. Let's talk. This is the big paper, uh, which most of you are very much familiar with. In reality, the big paper is not a constellation. It's not a constellation. It's actually an asteroid. It's just an asteroid because the big dipper is part of a much larger object. So the constellation itself is worth a major. The constellation. It's a little bit deeper. Okay. But the whole constellation itself is worth a major. It's a part of the constellation. It's worth a major. It's a big dipper. So that's why uh, there's, a popu uh, there's a popular misconception that the big big bird is a constellation. It's not, it's just an asteroid. Because the constellation is worth the nature. Uh, you have this, summer triangle, three stars, Daniel, uh, Vega, and Valeria. Uh, you also have this one, which is the Earth. Uh, 
the winter time, you know, so we have frozen yarn. Uh, we, we don't use and steer you. So steer you, in Spanish, you can drink that kind of the bright stars that we can use. After you, yeah. You only know when you take your own thing. Uh, hand up there is a higher power. Steer you to that. Uh, anyone know who, what this star is in the right? So this star is bad, steer you. The concert is also right, the opposite of the other two. The same right self is the other one. The concert is the same. The other one is the same. So these are the people that need J.K. Rowling to find out the other one is the same. So this is the star bell. Okay, maraming, maraming characters in Harry Potter actually. She's not an actor. Uh, astronomical about this, such as, well, Draco, then go down to one. Draco is a constellation, actually. Uh, we also have zodiacal constellations, but these are constellations uh, that the sun passes through and it traverses across the sky. And there are how many? There are 13 zodiacal, zodiacal constellations that astronomers have known for thousands of years. There are in general objects, alam nyo na, Yung, nagpapasa sa horse po. Well, so mali yun kasi uh, that's in the realm of astrology, which is actually a pseudoscience. In reality, we have 13 zodiac constellations. As shown here. So kung mapapansin yun, in astrology, kung sinasin yun sa horse po, ito yung mga dates na binibigay sa mga. But the actual dates for each constellation is this, based on astronomical data. So ibang iba, kung ibang iba ngayon dun sa dates na uh, so this is also one way of debunking astrology. Because all your life, you think you have a Pisces. You think you have a Pisces or you have a Pisces. So that means, you don't have an effect in your life. You don't have an effect in your life. You don't have an effect in your life. Other than gravity. Think about it. Think about it. So there's Perseus, then Joan, and Andromeda. Chasia, the parents of Andromeda, and Chasia, and Seth. So that's actually made of the people of Pegasus. So that's the constellation of the constellation. Orion, the most famous constellation, the one of Orion's belt. So he's a very arrogant hunter, so he went with one of that. Uh, the Greek god and uh, Scorpio is in him, a very small animal is in him, which is the constellation of Scorpio. Yeah. So, but he didn't know the night sky, but the Orion, Palabas, and he's Horizon. He's Scorpio, Paset, so on. And vice versa. But for Asi Scorpio, that he's Orion, Palabas, so on. So, how did they get to the night sky? So, he didn't know the night sky at the same time. So, when I'm saying it's that, I'm not going to say it. What else can you see? This is that blatant flood. Flooding on the astral lab. These are the images taken by the students of Astrodolus lab. So, this one is last May of Superman, taken by three students who were taking their practicum sa Pagasa. And this is the official image of Pagasa taken by students of astrophysics lab. Uh, sorry, not solar exists. Lunar exists, the photo lunar exists. Uh, last December 10th, uh, this was observed by the students of the year APEC. Now we have APEC people. Uh, this is within the UPLD campus. Live, alive, live, in the campus. Using an SLR camera. Uh, what else? Lunar exists also in Dallas, in Pagalina. Uh, partial solar exists, but then they get the school of uh, lab, astro lab. This is also the official image of Pagasa for the partial solar exists. Uh, the most uh, recently and the most popular image of Pagasa, uh, the Venus transit, which happened last in the city. Okay. So in June, the giant Venus passed in front of the sun, and 
this is the best image taken from the whole village. Uh, this was uh, taken in Naya Kapaninata, North Naya. Okay. All the part of the whole building was crowded out except for the region people. And I took that.